is still in Egypt and could be here tonight. And this was about a year and a half ago. And she, as she is making her extraordinary and groundbreaking forays into experimental theater and performance, was talking about roots and how she, as a young black theater artist, noted the conspicuous absence of those like her in the popular discursive history about this work. And she said, where are your roots, Daniel? And I said, my roots are in the river. And I longed for that river for years before I found it. And I first stepped foot into that river when I was 15 years old in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I was given an assignment for my first drama club experience to go find a monologue. And I didn't even really know what that was. And I went to the section of plays. And I stood before it. And I didn't know. I didn't know. So I closed my eyes pulled the play down that was for color girls. <laughs> and I opened the book and I knew this work. I knew this world. And I got to one piece in particular and I got, you know when you get sweaty <laughs> and your all the hair stands up on your back and you're nervous and your bones are shaking and it said one thing I don't need is any more apologies. I got sorry to meet me at my front door. And I scrambled through the library book, and I saw the photograph of the woman who had delivered that monologue, the lady in blue. There she was. There, thank you, that's it. And I committed the cardinal sin. I ripped the photograph out of the library book, <laughs> and I brought it home, and I put it on my wall in my bedroom. Not seven years later, I was in graduate school, and Aisha Rahman invited me to be a part of a workshop of her play. And she said, oh, my friend's coming up from New York to direct it. My friend Lori. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until after we were working that I said, that's Lori Carlos, <laughs> who used to be on my wall. The following summer, I went to the National Black Theater Festival, and I walked out of the van in North Carolina, and the first person I saw was Lori Carlos, and she said to me, we've been waiting for you. I longed for the river, and my longing for the river brought me to the river, but the river existed all along. My longing for the river was proof of the river's existence. Huh? And so tonight is about that river. And it's about my roots in that river. And it may be about our roots in that river. Rhonda Ross, Stacy Robinson. Come on. <laughs> Welcome the river to the stage, Bonnie Burroughs, Robin McCauley, Jessica Aguilar, Maya Bronte. All right, it's already popping now, so let's go. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, this is how we do. Robin, can you tell the story about Viney? I came to New York in the mid 60s to go into theater, which was as vague as it was for me. <laughs> and found myself at a performance called Walk Together Children by Vanya Burroughs. <laughs> and I realized 
during her piece that this is what I came for, to stand and deliver things that felt right to me. And I remember that her last piece, I'm not sure it was her last piece, but that's a piece that felt like the last piece, was W.E.B. and Booker T. And what I loved about it was that it was about the range of our lives as African American and American people. Beautiful. Stacy, do you have a question for Ravi? I do. <laughs> Ravi, I wanted to know, it's a big one. Uh-oh. <laughs> what story or belief did you have to let go of in order to be free? Ooh. And how did you release it? I had to let go of the belief that I had to get better. Mm -hmm. I think I grew up with thinking that there was something less than, and I realized later that that was just simply political. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. And Robbie, um, you have a piece of Stacy Robinson's uh, performance, Quiet Frenzy, that you're going to share with us. We decided that we were going to give one another excerpts of one another's work. Kaboom. What? How'd I get this scar? You know this, Doc. Long story short, I was in a car accident with my sister. She died. I survived. No, there's really not a whole lot more to tell. I don't have any memory of it. The actual crash. It was hot first heat of spring, a record breaker, a Saturday. We hadn't seen each other in a long time, my sister and I. We put on tight, tight shorts, went to stroll. We spent hours walking in circles, holding hands. The people, they couldn't take their eyes off of us. We were looking too good. We weren't wasting no time. We were together, that was our day. I remember I felt fully alive. Even my skin was breathing. She kept holding me. I kept falling over because everything was funny. All day her tummy was tickling. When she was happy, her tummy would tick. We was moving as one, so my tummy was tickling. Not just the twin thing. You know, as a twin, sometimes you hear the other's thoughts but this was more deliberate, as if she was directing herself in to out of me. It made me giggle. We were eating sun. Must have been because of all of a sudden it was late dark. I'm so stupid we were seven blocks away. Later, a cop told me there were a lot of DUIs that day because it was so pretty. People all over the city had been celebrating the surprise holiday. Anyway, who pulls up beside us but the op shop boys? These guys we grew up with, they insisted on taking us home. Juke gave us the front seat because Bobo was real fat. There wasn't enough room for all of us in the back. We wouldn't have been comfortable. They always treated us real gentle, like real ladies. We were in the front. She was on my lap. Kaboom! Not that I remember. I just remember losing breath, seeing Nisi, my sister, everywhere. She was multiplied many, 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 many times. All 
around me was Nisi dancing, holding me, hugging me cheek to cheek, tugging my ears, kissing my eyelids. Every part of her was singing the song we made up as kids. Angel, oh angel, my angel, oh, oh angel. I was in bliss. I was erupting. Always little explosions of me. It was all of me was embraced by her. She kept singing and I kept saying, Nisi, oh Nisi, my Nisi, isn't this the best day? do play a role in the process. Um, I see folks, I smell things, um, I hear things that are clearly not from me when I'm working. Um, the more that I allow, the more they are present. Um, I think some of them are my ancestral books, but I also think that they are the ancestry of the work that I'm supposed to do. Or they may be, I, there's lots of my bloodline that I don't know, so it may be bloodline. Um, and I think that it's been a process for me to um, embrace their presence and allow their input completely, as completely as possible. That's the, that's the process for me, to keep allowing them as There's an excerpt from a new play that Jessica is working on, and we're going to have Helga Davis and Maya Boateng read this excerpt. Oh, interesting. Can we read the stage directions at the top? No. exactly what I said my library extends to every room, even the kitchen and bathroom. Nothing like poetry in the kitchen, I always say. Or when you're taking a shit first thing in the morning, I call it communing with God. Does the word shit offend you? I understand that Filipinos are very gracious and refined. I can certainly curtail. I love cursing. Do you? <laughs> You know, I find it astonishing that you've never read or even, God help me, heard of Borges. Given the fact that you call your personal little library infinite, which is not only amusing but prescient, given the fact that I've read your poems right here and can see that you have an ear, or shall we say at the very least, imagination and curiosity. Curiosity is essential, for without it you can't call yourself a writer and certainly not a poet. No matter how many twinkling metaphors you might string up like Christmas lights, if there isn't daring or rigor or honesty behind those festive Christmas lights, then it won't matter. You understand. Now, Borges, despite being blind. He's blind? Blind, yes. But that <laughs> did not stop the work. <laughs> Though I'm not a fan of everything, I believe you should soak it all up like a sponge. 
I mean, even that quasi-mystical esoteric nonsense about tigers and female Chinese pirates. This is my theory, and only my theory, so you can be dismissive at any time. <laughs> the blind man can't help himself. He's a repressed fairy, and probably a benign fascist to boot. <laughs> Benign fascist and oxymoron. <laughs> Borges is Argentine, after all, and like a lot of Latin men, quite the mama's boy, which I certainly don't mind. I adore pussy, but I've danced the tango with gorgeous fairies from Buenos Aires, and as you probably heard, I'll try anything. Get away, you have to act fast. <laughs> Kill on sight, even if it means using your bare hands or feet. We have giant ones in the Philippines called Ippies, Necron. They fly Ippies. Well, there you go. <laughs> Flying fascists. <laughs> and there's a dirty war going on mother country as we speak, just like the one in Chile and Argentina. Of course, my theory about Borges has been called nutty and incoherent, but I'm too old to give a shit about those assholes in New York. Here, a somewhat clunky translation by some Brit I've never heard of. Brits have no ear for the rhythms of Spanish, but it's better than nothing. Bring the blind man back when you are done, and you can borrow something else. Really? You close by. Whenever you want, and pick out a book, or two, or three, would you like a copy of my new translations of Lorca's poetry? <coughs> I can inscribe it. <laughs> wow! Thank you, Declan. I, I love Lorca. Most. Watch you don't end up imitating him too much. Lorca's too easy to love. Jessica, do you have a question for Miss Bayou? I do. I even wrote it down, but I'm just going to do what these other fabulous women have done. And you know, this comes from Daniel and I earlier this year went to see you in Richard Maxwell's dystopian cowboy extravaganza <laughs> called Samara. And we were blown away by the play, the ensemble. Most of all, we were blown away by you because it's a very challenging piece. And you were singing, you were doing poetic monologue, it was very physical. I mean, everyone was rolling around on the floor. And I'm wondering, given your long and illustrious and adventurous career in the theater as a performer, from Genese the Blacks to the recent 
very playful, good person in Sichuan. And then the Maxwell team. What is it about these very different and very challenging works that entices you as a performer? I think I find it uh, a little difficult to answer that question directly because you are speaking about my performance in two different plays. What excites me always is the text, mm -hmm. the word, in the beginning was the word. Um, and once I have that excitement in a play that challenges my understanding of what it is to be a particular human being, then I become involved. And I don't know if that really answers your it question. Does, it does. The text. Thank, Thank you. you. Beautiful segue, speaking of text, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I would ask uh, Vani and Rhonda to read an excerpt of a play that they both were actually in in production of mine called Phoenix Fabric. Gal. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Watch this here. No, thank you, ma'am. What's that there? Don't recall. Yes, you do. Don't know at all. Yes, you do. I'd rather get going. Let morning come. What's that there, gal? Fire they use. How's that go? Gonna string him first, gonna burn him last. And what between? Shouts and hits. Why is that? I don't recall. He looked too wild. I don't recall. His chin too I high. I don't recall. He took too long. Hurts my eyes. What's all that? Camera flash. They make a picture. Picture the past. They smile and so. Pick them a nigger. Good hats and dresses. See them have the doctor pick them a nig. Pickles and pie. They pick my shafts. Send it to their family. Send it to their friends. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Wish you was here. Ella. Ella. Yes, ma'am. What's that there? That there shaft. Is not. Yes, ma'am, it is. That burnt up meat. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That blackened bone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Where's his face? He picked it clean. All the men. All those birds. That you, Ella? Is that me where? Waiting in the night. Please don't hear. Climbing that tree. Gotta get him down. What will you see? Just my hands. What, no axe? My own bare hands. Your hands are stained. Where's he go? We'll bury them. Where's he go? We'll bury the bone. His precious bones. They got his bones. What about his soul? How he gonna rise? His precious soul. Never you mind, I'll make him back. No such thing. Fashion his bones, conjure his blood. No gal, catch the light. Catch the light? The light of the land. All answers in that night. I've ever seen in my life. And I knew that from the first time I met you um, when you were at Fordham. And it's a thing that you just know, that there's a particular gift that a person has. It doesn't mean that everyone else isn't wonderful at what they do, but there's some people that just have that extra thing. Thank you. And I think of that as a part of the call of the river, right? And we've talked a lot in the past about this question of the call and response, which is so key to our, our cultural tradition. Um, what called to you? Um, what drew you 
to performance. And do you at this moment in all our culture and politics feel that it is the most viable thing for you to be doing in response? Well, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I think what called to me was a responsibility that I didn't understand at the time. Um, I started performing very, very young on. I was started off step dancing and mime dancing and I came from a place that was um, disenfranchised, impoverished, and it seemed like performance was the better option. Um, and so at the time, what called to me was release um, and a search for a voice. Um, because I, I kept hearing around me that <laughs> being from where I was from, you had to, it meant that you would end up a certain way. Um, but something about performing and acting and dancing allowed me to find my own voice. Uh, so that's what initially called to me. And now, there is nothing else I would rather be doing. There's nothing else I can, I'm looking at the, I'm talking so long, but that question is, is, is a lot, so. <laughs> With such division and divide in our country right now, um, I'm sure it's always been there, but for me, I feel it so strongly now in a way that I didn't before and it seems so stark. Um, and there's always a question of what do you do? How do I help when it all seems so massive and so beyond you? Um, and what I have is my voice, what I have is my mind and my creativity and my curiosity. Um, I don't have answers. And I think that's the beauty in, in, in art right now, um, because there are a lot of answers being thrown. There are a lot of, that aren't answers. They're just individual truths. Um, so yeah, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing, uh, and that's scary. May we hear a bit of your piece, Stacy? will you read some of my Work. Spinning and swimming and searching, I'm trying to dismantle too many years of tending towards quiet and silence and mouth sealed so deep in the way I was brought up. Donning obedience like a king's robe, squelching and choking on words I wish to say. Somehow, it seems I no longer know how to speak my Truth, it gets lost, it gets scorched, dissipating into a million places. I'm trying to catch it all, trying to learn what it feels like to finally breathe again. I have an Eartha May, and she's Yah. Name I was given at birth, but Yah? Amuakwa Waten. Ya Amuakwa Waten. Ya from Yawada. For born on Thursday. Amuakwa for she that fights. Waten for help that goes a long way. Name only given to babies destined as Ashanti Queen Mothers butchered by American blacks who, generations scarred by the door of no return, have no clue that my name brings you a little closer. 
closer to home, your home, that place where they lied and told you you could never return to. So they bathed no, brainwashed you, then drowned you in the Atlantic. Now we still afraid to swim of the water, of the weight, of the flow, of the depth. Steadily surviving, trying to catch out, catch our breath. Until another brother screams, I can't breathe. about music that an 
gentle and subdued. The music, not just of the words, but the, the music that you listen to. When I was reading your text, all I can hear is music. Mm. It feels very much like a, like a kind of, of um, is it a piano solo or a horn solo? interesting because as a young writer, I use music to propel me in my writing. And to this day, I listen to everything. I listen to a lot of Miles in the electric period. And I listen to a lot of um, opera, depending on what I'm writing, and also a lot of Latin music. Um, but a song by women like Concha Fuica, so that puts me in a certain um, frame and the way the language flows. And, and then, of course, you know, there's all that in Sonia and art ensemble that was important as I was coming up as a writer. And that showed me different rhythms and the dissonance, the importance of it. And rock and roll always, always, always. Hmm. Were you all part of each other's communities also? Did you know that? You yeah, I would like to collaborate with music, and I had a band when I was younger, and um, you know, it taught me so much. I, I, I didn't, uh, I'm a self-taught writer. You know, I mean, just from reading and kind of listening to other writers. So the music took it to another place. But that's such a big thing, because uh, we don't, it, it means then that if you're a writer, you're a writer, right? You don't have an excuse for not writing. Mm -hmm. um, you can't say, oh, well, I don't have a degree in, and I haven't gone to, if it's in you to do, yeah. it's your work to do. I agree, yes. It's just, it's imp I think it's so important that people hear that, right? Because so often, I think we think we need another kind of validation and permission to do what it is that is in us. Especially and now, I think that's pushed on young people, and I used to teach and tell them, you really don't need to be here. <laughs> <laughs> of all the craziness and one wonderful thing is that Robin McCauley is now back in New York full time. Yeah. yeah. And um, and what, one of the great things, can you give us a little news maybe about your piece coming up? Yes. <laughs> Flyers aren't out yet, <laughs> as we said back in the day, now it's all online. I'm doing my recent work, Sugar, at Live Arts in February. Yeah. And so um, we're going to experience a little piece of that, uh, and Maya, you will bring in. Falling down in somebody's living room in Prague. I'm desperate for food, desperate for sugar. Sirens, sirens in foreign cities, grateful for fish sticks and soup. Sleeping only in dreams, backstage awards, horses pounding in dreams, boats and drowning musicians. My heart pumps. Breathe away, full of horror, fearing God, no solution. Where is love? Angels call, children fall, guns everywhere. Forgive me, Jesus. People rush through alleyways, call up at windows, keys, Lord, keys to salvation. Trucks and couches and books, broken pieces. 
pianos moved in the night. Still, I hear the trucks, they come in the night. Who's in charge? I swallow hard back in America. The end of the century shifting like the end of time. In a famous working class city, no longer black, with the soot that helped people pay bills, now full of unemployed people, black and white, down by the river, asking me if my father had worked in ovens in the war, I said. And poets suck the outside cafes hoping for somebody to listen again. Extraordinary person in this world. Could you say some ways that you have gotten through as an extraordinary person in this world? to continue to practice community, like real community, putting one's body in the line of fire, putting, putting one's life in the places where you want to see change. For me, it's not an accident that we are around this table, not only because we know Daniel, Yours are the eyes, the stories, the songs, the, the, uh, the hands that I hold, that I gather with me when I sit in the morning. And I have a friend who, she has a, a son, when he was first born, before he would sleep at night, she would say, who loves you? And he would actually fall asleep, naming, trying to name all the people that he knew loved him. And I do a very similar thing, especially in these times. For me, one of the hardest things to remember sometimes is that it doesn't matter the noise and the chaos that I am loved and held mm -hmm. by people seen and unseen. And so in the morning when I wake up, I light a candle and I sit mm -hmm. and I begin to name them. 
and then I say yes, and then I say thank you, and then I go. Thank you, thank you. As you can tell, we um, we all considered a question and it was important that we didn't share that beforehand. But I would begin now to ask you to consider a question that you might want to bring to this group of people um, as we continue. There will be space for your questions. Um, Ms. Viney, I asked you to think of a question for me. <laughs> I was just in Cairo with Kaneza Shaw, and at one point I looked to her and I said, you have been one of my great teachers, even though I've only known her a short time, because she's tall, and she's long, <laughs> and she has to look like this to see the people, and her mind, she refuses to make it small, to make anyone else comfortable. So it gets to operate at a rev that allows her to do the work in real time. And I said, thank you for teaching me something about being in my body again. So my answer for you has to do with, I think on some level I make work to remember what it is to be embodied. And I sometimes feel like I'm a little girl and a little boy hiding inside of a man, waiting for the woman who is the goddess to arrive. And it's a community in here. And so when a piece is gestating at the very, 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 very beginning, they run and tell me, they're like, come look, come meet her, and that's Mother Dixon who you read. He said, come look, that's Eleanor. Um, your mama being the biggest example of something, they come from away, and then they literally change my physiology as I work. I gain weight, I lose weight, I have aches and pains. They, they change me, and they bring their wounds and they demand that I engage their wounds. And then they bring their magic, and they demand that I learn the spells. And when I've done both, there's a piece. But it is absolutely, gender is big, and the work that I still have to do at 47 is to ask myself again and again, when they go, and when the little girl goes to play and the little boy goes to sleep and the goddess has gone into the dark side of the moon, what do I do? And I don't know yet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maya? Yeah. Do you have a question for Rhonda, Suzanne, and Ross? Oh, I do. <laughs> I love that you know my middle name. <laughs> Suzanne, that's my, that's my mom's name. Um, so, Rhonda, okay, so I've been pondering the words success and failure so strongly. 
I've been out of school for two minutes. And I'm like, I'm failing at everything. <laughs> so I want to I want to know from you. I mean, you are a person who's artistry and person and career I highly admire. And it looks like success to me. Um, I've often heard that you don't, no one actually fails at anything, right? That you just don't produce the intended result. You're just putting an opinion onto the thing. And, it, and that it's just an illusion. Um, so I wonder from you, do you agree with that? How do you handle failure? How do you see success? And if failure is an illusion, is success also an illusion? Um, just how do you view those things? Okay. Um, I think that one can fail if the if their definition of success is finite. If, if, I'm, if I need to get into that college to be successful, then I can fail. Right. But I don't tend to think of it like that. So to answer your question, uh, I don't know that I have a, <laughs> my version of success, and I do feel successful, but it's a practice. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a daily deepening. And it's a, and Stacey mentioned it in her answer to me, it's a daily, um, momently releasing of me to let my ancestors and let spirit flow through me and a, and a, um, and a, a momently um, ability to, to, to mine and, and go deeper and engage the world kinds of things, but it's a moment to moment thing. And I can, I can almost touch it now and miss it in the next minute and almost get it again. And, but that practice, the imagery of a river just came to me, that river, it's, it's not finite. Like if I get there, I've made it. It's a moment to moment trying and hitting and missing and trying again and asking a different question and looking at it upside down. And so I feel successful when I practice that. When I practice that as an artist, when I practice that as a mother, when I practice that as a friend mm -hmm. and as a daughter. And sometimes I get it and sometimes I don't and then I have to try it again and tweak it. You know, um, but because of that, I don't have a big issue about um, age. Like I don't have a big like, oh, my 46, I was supposed to have done X, Y, and Z, because because it's that mm -hmm. moment to moment thing. And I and I and it makes me want to wake up in the morning and try. One other tiny thought came about gender that I feel actually is connected to this idea of it not being finite. Mm -hmm. um, and Tanisha uh, Christie is here, another extraordinary performance artist, and we shared another mentor, Rebecca Rice. Um, and I want to just again call our missing Lori Carlos, uh, call her name. Um, and thinking about if you have, everyone got one of the flyers and in the inside there's this map. Uh, I asked everyone about their influences and their people. And so this is, this is a tiny portion of that. And we hope you'll add to this, right? Take this home and add to this. But that we, we're, we're connected in a very particular way 
but some of the most extraordinary teachings happen because of the odd ways that we come together and the odd ways that we relate with one another. And I'm working on a book that's kind of about what we're talking about here, right? And one of the things I remember is how often Rebecca, Kathy Gagnon, um, there were a number of people who were mentors to me, would be talking to me and they'd be like, girl, and it wasn't a slip. I knew they saw me as their little sister as much as they saw me as their little brother. And I knew they were indoctrinating me into this work with some of that in their spirit, right? So the question then becomes if we see one another and we see things in one another that are incongruous but loud to us, maybe it's a really good thing to cultivate that, right? Um, we're going to do one thing and then we're going to come to you. Um, Rhonda, will you lead us? what you said, Helga, about no matter what's going on around the craziness that you can know that you're loved and you're held. And, and a lot of what I write about in my songs is that feeling of I have the ability to feel loved or, or I have the ability to control my own personal freedom mentally, emotionally, spiritually, no matter what. And so the song that I wrote Nobody said the road would be easy. It's harder than I thought it would be. Now and then, 
is what it says. It says. Ain't nobody's job to be happy. Nobody's job to pull you through. Ain't nobody born to give you sunshine. That's life's inside of you. Ain't nobody gonna seek your freedom. Your heart will lead you through. You're the one to choose how you feel it. Nobody's business if you do. People know what no no matter where they are can call out. Things happen inside um, prisons and so forth. Um, and the theater company that originated inside. Mm -hmm. These are hard things mm -hmm. to do, but the call is something that mm -hmm. who 
pulls you up, and you can feel yourself rocking it and seeing the people keep taking the chains off. Thank you. word correcting is that what you want to use in your question maybe that's too individual to me yeah but I guess uh, in whatever way you think art can should be pushing us forward socially politically in our narratives in the way we see people how is that manifesting that I think each artist would have a different, maybe not answer, but it would be interesting to hear from everyone. And I don't know if I'm hearing your question right, but I think when I write, you know, the artists I know and love and respect do the work because as Robbie says, um, it's calling you and it's the way you engage with the world. Um, and whether that changes anything, you know, I don't know. All I know is I write a scene that feels true to me, that there is a truth in the fiction I create. There is some kind of, maybe you're striving for some kind of honesty that is like a mirror that you hold up to the world. And whoever's ready to receive it will receive it. Now, I don't know if Donald Trump gives a shit because he doesn't, he's a moron, you know, and, and he does not respond to this stuff. So I, 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 I really feel powerless to change that terror we live with, okay? I can only do what I can do. And I think oftentimes, all we can hope for is that we might surprise someone who's not the, one of the converted. You know, maybe someone who accidentally walked into the nightclub or the theater or the performance space or the, the, uh, the Nick Cave installation and happened upon Helga handing out a gun, you know, as part of her performance. And you see that metaphor beautiful art and this beautiful woman, you know, offering a gun to the audience. Yeah, it's a poem to me. It's not, it's not the answer that's going to change all this brutality and chaos and terror because I think that's, that's the world. That's human, you know, we're, we're, terrible to each other, but I think some of us artists, we're interested in holding up that mirror and just maybe people look at what's in that mirror and say, ah, oh, I understand a little bit about what I do uh, or what my fellow human beings do. You know, it's a kind of way of achieving some kind of embrace of even the terror. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I don't strive to, I don't feel that I have that kind of power. I don't have the power to hold the mirror. Mm -hmm. I want to. Mm -hmm. I think I started out wanting to change the world. Mm -hmm. You did.
Jessica. So, uh, what does the work? And hopefully, it affects people. And because you want to change the world, that's part of your voice. And, and if I can chime in, um, most of the songs that I write help me <laughs> to untangle um, whatever it is I'm in. And usually what I, at least, well, I was gonna say recently, but for some time, I've been untangling my feelings of powerlessness because I can't change a shooter on the 32nd floor. I have absolutely no power for that. I cannot change uh, Trump or any of that. I cannot change Puerto Rico, I can't change any of that right now. But I do have power. I have power over something. It's over myself, it's over, but it's over how I see it, or how I view it, or how I align with it or don't align with it, or how I speak about it, or how I allow, how do I digest it, do I not digest it? You know, I have, there's a power in that, and, and most of my songs are kind of looking at where do I have power? I'm raising a boy, I have power in that. Um, I have relationships, and there's power in that. This is powerful, what you've done tonight. So I'm looking always for where do I have power, and how can I then use that hopefully a force for at least my opinion of good outside of myself. Just to add to that, I think, don't be fooled by this idea of saying yes, that it's, it's some kind of feel good, embrace everybody and everything kind of thing. It is not that. It is also about expanding our ability to hold complexity. That's what saying yes is for me. So that I can take a porcelain gun in the middle of a performance and point it at someone while I'm in a gown singing an aria. It's saying yes to many, many, many things, including acknowledging that I have a killer in me, right? And that unless that killer is allowed to speak, to cry, to mourn, that no one will speak mm -hmm. because she's in me. So it, it is also about saying yes to the things in ourselves, in the way that, that we hurt, that we enjoy hurting, because there, there is that too. And remembering that uh, I'm, I'm not interested in changing anyone because I don't want you to try and change me. I'm clear about that. So, but what I can do to be closer to you and what I hope you would do in order to be closer to me is to expand your idea of what it is to be close to me. And what you are willing to tolerate from me in order to see me. And if we're not doing that, we're not really talking about anything. Or we are only talking. <laughs> So uh, we're going to wrap, um, and in conclusion, um, and in response uh, to your question as well, um, I think it must have been about seven years ago, Bonnie, and I saw you, as I often do, I'll pass you on, I pass you on the street randomly, not randomly. <laughs> and you came up to me, and you grabbed, I don't know if you remember this, you grabbed me by my wrist, and you said, life 
is motion. Life is motion. Life is motion. And then you moved on. <laughs> and that's how our conversation is all the way. Um, we wrote a song about it. It's Helga's favorite song that we sing in the show. Um, but I think that idea and this idea of the river that we started with, that one of the things that, that the mechanism that the moment we're in comes out of depends upon is paralysis. Mm. And so motion is the means to a process that may lead you to the questions that you need. But you gotta move. And I wanna thank all of you for moving us so deeply today. And back at the beginning again, right on time, there she is, for moving us. And thank you, thank you, thank you to Prelude and to Andrew and to everyone uh, for inviting us here. What an honor to be with you. And we're gonna clear for the next performance, but I'm sure if you, we can gather in the lobby if you wanna have remarks with thank folks. You. Thank you. Thank you.